Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning again. Welcome to High Tech 2012. We're so excited that you have come to join us in San Francisco. And I hope that you have already been having a really good time and learning a lot at the pre-conference workshops, as well as seeing, taking a little time to see some of the sights of San Francisco. It's such a lovely place to be in such lovely weather, especially for those of us who have been burning up in places. other places. Pretty great. I look forward to the next two days for a time in which we can share with one another and improve technician, improve technician education across the nation. And in fact, we have people from outside of the United States so perhaps our reach will be a little bit beyond our own country. A conference such as this does not produce itself, and I certainly am not responsible for all of it. If you think I am, forget it. <laughs> not true. Before we get to the specific welcoming remarks, I want to take a moment to recognize the members of the executive leadership team who met every two weeks all of the last year to put together the plans for the conference. Would the following people please stand, and would you hold your applause until the last person has risen, and then we will applaud for all of them. Let's start with James Jones from the IMPICT Center, and Elaine Johnson from BioLink, who are the on-site co-chairs. Please stand. No, 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 no wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> Um, Marilyn Barger from the Flight Center, a past chair. Mel Cosette from Matt Ed, who's in charge of awards. Phil Davis and Minerva Borger from Geotech, who are in charge of business. Mike Lasecki from Maytech, in who is in charge of sponsorship, of sponsorship and is a past, and is a past chair. chair. Deb, Newberry. Deb Newberry from Nanolink is in charge of marketing. Gordon Snyder from the ICT Center is in charge of dissemination. And you will notice that we are videoing several sessions. We are doing streaming this time, and we're going to have sessions going out on the web throughout the whole thing. Thank you to Thank all, you of, these to all of these people for all, they, for have all they have done. I would also, I would like, also like to ask the members, ask the members of, their of their committees to stand. To stand. Many of these, of these folks, folks spent countless, countless hours, hours on, their on their work. Their names, their names are, shown are shown on page two of your, two program. Of your program. And note also, and note also that Tom, that Tom McGlue, McGlue, the program, the program chair, chair, is not is with us because, because he, is, he is returning, returning to, industry. to industry. But Tom, but Tom has, has done a humongously wonderful job in getting a very relevant program put together. So would the committee members please stand? They're all bad. Let's, just, Let's applaud. just applaud. Additionally, I would like, I would to, like to thank Sheila Wilson, Wilson and David Bond, and David Bond from, Cord, from Cord, with whom we contracted, we contracted to, coordinate to coordinate all the details, all the details of, the of the conference, and they've done a they've fabulous, done a fabulous job. job. Finally, Finally, I would like I would to, like to uh, recognize, recognize the contingent from my home, from my National, home Science National Science Foundation, Foundation ATE Center, Center, the Convergence, the Convergence Technology, Technology Center. Center. Please, Please wave. You wave. don't have, you to, don't get have to get up. We are, we are 25, 25 strong, strong over, there, over there, and I appreciate, and I appreciate all, their all their support. Now for now the formal, formal thank yous. Thank Those were the Those informal, were the informal ones, ones, in case you didn't get it. All right. Thank you to our sponsors. Sheila? Sheila? Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, National, Science National Science Foundation, Foundation Lockheed Lock Martin, and the EMC Academic Alliance. <laughs> I would also like to recognize our executive producers. Would you all please stand? I'm not going to read you off one at a time. Please stand. Next, I'd like to recognize our producers. Would you please stand? Finally, and our finally, associate producers, would you all please stand? We are also so very fortunate to have almost 50 exhibitors. Would you all please stand? Yay. 
And please do plan to join us this afternoon from 4.30 to 6 o'clock on the Pacific level, which is one floor underneath us, for the exhibitor showcase. And take time to thank the, all the exhibitors for being there and helping us put on this conference. This truly is a National Science Foundation community event. It takes, I hate to say it takes a village, but I'm going to do it. It takes a village to get this thing put together, and I appreciate everyone who has had a contributing part. Now for the real welcoming remarks. To welcome us to San Francisco, we have Dr. Alice Marijo. Dr. Marijo, a New York native, began her higher education work experience as an instructional assistant in English as a second language in that program in Puerto Rico. She has 32 years experience as a community college faculty member and administrator in Puerto Rico, Florida, and for the last 23 years in California. She has held numerous management responsibilities in universities and community colleges from Puerto Rico to California. She's active in many community and statewide organizations focusing on STEM and immigrant issues as well as other topics. She is currently Vice Chancellor of Academic Affairs at City College of San Francisco. And I know firsthand she is a dedicated supporter for STEM education and for the National Science Foundation ATE program in particular because I have seen her at numerous events. Dr. Marijo earned her doctorate in research design and statistics from Florida State University a master's degree in mathematics from the University of Florida, and a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Catholic University of Puerto Rico. She also holds a certificate in management and leadership in education from the Harvard Institute. Dr. Marijo. Good morning. Welcome to San Francisco. On behalf of City College of San Francisco, I extend you a warm welcome to our beautiful city and the High Impact 2011 Conference, which we are so very proud to host. Um, I want to welcome especially all the community college faculty, counselors, administrators, uh, the workforce development advocates that are always joining us, our corporate and industry partners, and the technicians. This conference has been carefully planned by a visionary group to bring us the best of what is available, available. in high-tech uh, education. So I do appreciate all the 26 centers who have contributed their expertise and talents in bringing, and bringing this event together, as well as the sponsors who believe in the community college and what we're doing for workforce development. For those of you who came in earlier this week, you've already enjoyed a series of events that have been carefully planned. Uh, for those of you who were in the Napa wine trip yesterday, I'm, I'm sure you had a great time. The Cisco event and BioRad tours were also another example of what we have available in the local Bay Area. Uh, what is coming in the next couple of days is an opportunity of wealth of knowledge and an opportunity to network with colleagues from across the nation. For all those exhibitors who are here and giving us those hands-on opportunities that we hear about in the sessions, that is critical for what we consider um, um, the advancement of workforce development and uh, technical education. Um, like Ann said, I have participated in events before uh, sponsored by these groups. I did the Synergy Conference a couple years ago, and that's when I first heard about how this um, new s a series of conferences were going to be organized. I attended the one last year, and I was totally amazed, totally amazed of, of the effort and the talent that comes together to make this happen for so many technicians who otherwise would have difficulty keeping up with what's happening in, in technology education. This is the event that um, past participants have said gets them up to speed in a quick fashion with so many colleagues and gives them the opportunity to network for further communications. Um, myself as an administrator, I find this conference to be critical because as we have limiting resources, we have to be able to identify what is critical for our communities and our students. And this is a conference that brings together um, those topics, um, those new directions, and it helps inform all the community colleges. So I'm hoping all of you, our faculty and counselors, please take this information back to your administrators because we have difficult decisions to make when we have limited budgets. 
Um, last but not least, I just want to publicly thank the team at City College of San Francisco, the people I work so closely with, because they've done a marvelous job in organizing and supporting the efforts of the national group. Um, that is Elaine Johnson, um, Pierre Thierry, and James Jones, and of course all the faculty and staff that have supported them throughout the year to help make this event um, be as positive as I'm seeing right here in front of me in terms of the attendance that I'm noting. And so on behalf of City College, welcome to San Francisco. I think I can promise you that the probability of good sunshine by 2 o'clock is relatively high. Um, for those of you who are leaving the hot weather from other parts of the country here, we are missing warm weather. So when we see the sun we come really out, enjoy it. Hope you have a wonderful time at the conference and also enjoy the city, uh, city, uh, city of San Francisco because it's an amazing city and has lots to offer. Welcome and, and enjoy your stay. Thank you. And now to welcome us from the National Science Foundation, we have Dr. V. Celeste Carter. Dr. Carter received her PhD in microbiology from the Pennsylvania State University School of Medicine, and she completed postdoc studies at the University of California in Berkeley. She joined the Division of Biological and Health Sciences at Foothill College in 1994 to develop and head a biotech program. program. From 2001 to 3, she served as program director in the Division of Undergraduate Education at the National Science Foundation. Prior to her arrival at the NSF, she was the recipient of a DO Award, an NSF DUE Award, which produced a set of case studies and associated labs with biotechnology industry partners. She returned to Foothill College in the fall of 2003 to resume her position as director for both the biotech and bioinformatics program. Dr. Carter returned to the NSF as a program director from 2007 to 2008 and again returned to Foothill College to resume teaching. But she finally got it right. <laughs> Dr. Carter recently accepted a permanent position in DUE as the lead program director for the ATE program and we are so glad to have her today to give us a welcome from the National Science Foundation. Celeste. Well, thank you, well, thank you, and I would very definitely like to add my welcome from the National Science Foundation and particularly the Advanced Technological Education Program to everyone who's here. Um, ATE is, a, is an amazing program, and obviously you could tell I was flipping back and forth across the country, and I'm, I'm glad Ann said I got it right. So um, I've been the permanent, uh, in a permanent position not quite two years, and I am the lead in the Division of Undergraduate Education for this program and very proud to serve in that capacity and to work with everyone, all of the centers who are here and all of the uh, um, uh, project uh, principal investigators as well. It's a, it's a fabulous program. And I, I don't want to take too much time, but just for those of you who don't know a lot about ATE, it was a congressionally mandated program. So uh, it was Congress who said to NSF, which a lot of times doesn't go over very well. NSF likes to you know, not really be told that they have to do something. But uh, Congress said um, in the 1992 Science and Technology Act, you, NSF, will create a program that leads to a quality technical workforce and has in a leadership role on every project a community college. So they saw the importance of community colleges in this, in this role. And that this program has now been going for close to 17 years. You see the amazing centers that are here. And, uh, and so what I would like to do is just say welcome. And if any of you need more information about the Advanced Technological Education Program, we're always looking to broaden the impact. And we think, and we think it's really critically important today that we really work on that quality technical workforce for the United States. So thank you and welcome to the conference. Thank you, Celeste. And you did get it right. <laughs> to welcome us on behalf of Lockheed Martin, one of our major sponsors, we have Richard Heeb. Rick is the Vice President of Science Engineering Analysis and Test Operations Lockheed at Martin Lockheed. Space Operations. Heeb, a former astronaut, retired from NASA in 1995 after six years in the Mission Operations Directorate at Johnson Space Center and almost 10 years in the Astronaut Corps. He flew three space shuttle missions, serving as payload commander for the 2nd International Microgravity Laboratory Mission, 
on STS-65 and as a mission specialist on STS-49 and STS-39. You didn't know I had this much detail, did you? <laughs> he has logged over 750 hours in space, including more than 17 hours of EVA. He holds a master's degree in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado Boulder and a bachelor's of arts degree in physics and mathematics from Northwest Nazarene College in Idaho. Mr. Hugh. I was expecting something a lot shorter, like Lockheed Martin, three space flights would have done it. Welcome, and let me congratulate you on being here to improve yourself, and also let me thank you on behalf of Lockheed Martin. As I look down the road, I mean, on the one hand, it doesn't seem like any of us are ever going to retire again, right, with the economy being what it is. Sooner or later, people are going to be retiring, and we need a continual influx of highly technical, technical people to do the things that need to be done in this country. And Lockheed Martin, like quite a few of my aerospace uh, competitors and colleagues, pretty much has to hire citizens. You know, almost everyone is public trust or clearance required, so we can't necessarily go get that workforce from elsewhere. And the world keeps changing. Now, as you heard, I kind of grew up in the space program. I, I was there for SDS-1 as a baby engineer in the control center and flew a few times, took my family down to watch Atlantis launch. That's the end of the shuttle program. We're not going to fly any more shuttle flights. I, I know there's some people out there that get this confused between is this just another one of those things where they act like it's going to end and then you know, we fly some more. No, there's no, no more external tanks. And they take about three years to build. Shuttle program is done. So what are we going to do next? So a lot of things going on. NASA is still budgeted roughly the same way. Lockheed Martin, we're building the Orion crew vehicle. Orion will be the next sort of government uh, human spaceflight vehicle. It'll take us a few years to get it there. But it's very much more high tech, and it requires the kind of people that are coming out of your programs to make all that work. Our competitors that are trying to do spaceflight commercially or whatever you want to call that term need the same kind of workforce. So with change also comes opportunity. There, are, everything is changing in our industry, especially in human spaceflight. But we still need the same kind of passionate, quality, well-educated people that we have always needed, because these programs are not successful unless every single person says, "It's not going to fail on my watch," and that's the kind of commitment that we get out of the people that you are training. So thank you, and please keep up the good work. To introduce our keynote speaker, we have Dr. Elaine Johnson, who is based at City College of San Francisco. Dr. Johnson is the PI for the National BioLink Center. She has actively worked with biotechnology educators and students throughout the United States to create a very strong community. She is a strong supporter for the National Science Foundation ATE program in general, and truly, innovation is her middle name. Okay. I was trying to figure out if I was missing an introduction here. <laughs> okay, Dr. Johnson. Again, another welcome, and it's my great pleasure to introduce a good friend and a local person in San Francisco who has, who has a global impact on the world of science and the world of education. Dr. Moira Gunn is here with us today. today. Many of you already know her. She has become a, a supporter of the ATE program over the years. She was a guest speaker at one of the conferences for Synergy and also came with us to moder uh, moderate a panel of students at the ATEPI meeting. Uh, Dr. Moira Gunn has a, is the first woman to ever receive a PhD in mechanical engineering from Purdue University. She also received an honorary doctor of science from Purdue. She has worked at NASA. She is currently an educator and is in charge of the biotechnology master's program at the University of San Francisco. 
So she comes very, very qualified to talk with us. But she's also got another side, and that's the host of a PBS a series program, Tech Nation and Biotech Nation. She's authored many articles, but including a book on Welcome to Biotech Nation. In that capacity, she regularly interviews leading people in the areas of technology and biotechnology. So she hears from people. She doesn't only talk, but she listens. And she then analyzes that and puts it in a way that the public can under understand and that her students can understand. Because of that work, she received one of the greatest honors in the country this past year. She received the Public Service Award from the National Science Board. The, you know, this, this is one single person in the country that received this. Now, for those of you that might not know this, the National Science, Science. Board is the governing board for the National Science Foundation and the policy advisor to the President of the United States and to Congress. Congress. Moira Gunn won this award for outstanding, extraordinary contributions to the education of the public and promotion of science and technology through a national weekly radio program with commentaries on scientific issues and in-depth interviews for a broad public audience. Are we lucky to have Moira here today as our kickoff speaker for this conference. Please help me welcome her. Thank you, thank you very much. And I have to tell you, it was exciting enough getting the award, but then they said, we're going to give it to you at a black tie dinner at the State Department. And I thought, ooh, this is really good. And I have to tell you, it's a really great party when someone comes up to you and says, ma'am, please stop touching the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> so all, all, all of us have a lot to learn about parties, I think. I want to thank you for inviting me here today because I have to say, I know a number of you, but I really, really love the work you're doing. I'm involved in the work that you're doing uh, on so many levels. Um, and I know some of you listen to the radio. In fact, someone just asked me out here if uh, I do the open to the show. So I'll do it for everybody once. You hear it in your iPods, you hear it out of your car radios and all of that. But you have to see it live. From San Francisco, I'm Moira Gunn, and this is Tech Nation. Now, we're in the business of, of technology, educating for technology. And I have to say, um, it's, it's an interesting question because we're all excited about it, but there's a number of people who really, who really aren't. <laughs> you know? It's not like 80% of the, of the uh, students are engineers or, or scientists. It's, uh, there's a lot more English majors out there. Of course, we all know that sports management is the largest uh, uh, popular undergraduate major, as a matter of fact. But, um, uh, but I remember being very excited about doing a show, and this is years ago now, going to NPR. And uh, there was a very nice gentleman sitting there, but he was really into more of the liberal arts thing, more of the, you know, what we know NPR is. But I was like, we got to have more tech tech. We got to have more science and everything. So I proposed this whole show, and he's looking at me the whole time, and he kind of scrunches his face up, and he goes, ah. Oh, Everybody's proposing technology programs these days. Technology is this year's blonde. <laughs> and I, I looked at him, I said, look, buddy, I'm this year's blonde. <laughs> technology is here to stay. <laughs> you know? And yet people kept asking me, why technology? Why technology? And I, uh, I was starting, I started out by saying, 
you know, the kinds of things other people were saying about why should we do shows on technology and science. And I, we were doing current job numbers, projected job numbers. The argument was that our economy is based on innovation, and innovation is technology. The argument is that we had to combat outsourcing. There was everything. There were more numbers and more and more numbers of all kinds, projections about technology. And I was having a hard time working with all these numbers. Not that it's about numbers. I started out a math major. I love numbers. But it was, what do these numbers mean? Were they really communicating anything? And I went to, I thought about the iPod. Now the iPod, uh, I, I didn't at the time because the iPod didn't exist, but later on I said this is exactly why I have trouble with shouting all these numbers to people and spouting all these numbers to people as an argument for why we should do something. The iPod debuted in fall of 2005. It's hard to believe we ever did without iPods and iPhones and all of this. Um, the analysts projected the holiday sales. On the low end, the naysayers said, maximum you're going to sell 5 million iPods. On the high end, the analysts said 8 million. And there had to be 15, 18 very major analysts jumping into the fray to project this. The actual 2005 sales from the projections of 5 to 8 million, 12 million iPods which reminds me of Ian Morrison. He's the a futurist, the former president of the Institute for the Future. He always says, the dirty little secret of futurism, futurism is that nobody can predict the future. So we can't predict a lot about technology, but we're trying to convince people about technology, and yet, what do these numbers mean? We keep saying the numbers are off, and so you, it's like, what can we do here? What can't we predict? Let's start there. We can't predict what technology will be built and when. We can't predict the rate of adoption of a technology. We can't, produce, we can't predict how it will actually be used. We can't predict what trend will rise fast and die, what will rise slow and have sticking power. There was a time when you could come into this room and say, MySpace, oh, MySpace, you know, still last year. I mean, whoever talks about that anymore. I mean, just this year, they were, they were devalued, uh, their, their capital uh, asset valuation uh, was devalued by 90%. I mean, it's like, you've got to be kidding. It's like, how could it be? Because it, there's not any there there. So we can be sure of one thing, and that is a huge amount of technology is going to be developed, and that's why we're here. We just don't know who, why, when, how, or, or what, you know. So why do I say huge? Because huge is what we need to really focus on. Well, technology is a product of inter the intertwined dance between science and engineering. Sometimes science says, you know, we just really figured this out, this search for the truth, this truth about how the universe works. And the engineers say, really? Oh, well, that means we can build technology this way, I bet. And so technology marches forward. Sometimes technology uh, goes ahead and builds something in the back and says, oh yeah, we could do this, you know, and the scientists say, that can't be. And uh, they look at it and they go, oh my goodness, because of how you built it, we now know something new about science. And then they usually say, we must publish. <laughs> I don't know why the engineers don't, but the scientists do. So, um, so this gives us some insight. If technology is the product of science engin and engineering, if we talk to Peter Schwartz, who is the author of Unintended Consequences and chairman of the Global Business Network, um, he says 85% of all the engineers who have ever lived are alive today, and 92% of all the scientists who have ever lived are alive today. So since technology is the product of science and engineering, this means we have a huge amount of technology and a huge amount of technology coming. So being pressed on numbers, being pressed on what it is or how it is, that we can't really do with any, we can, we can try, we can go get other people's references as to what they think, but we can guarantee there's gonna be a huge amount of technology and it also means we have to train, train and educate to agility, to the ability to move forward, to the ability to think out of the box. And let's also remember, instead of just building the technology, every time you put technology in the hands of a human, that human has the capability to think of a new use, a new capability, a new application, never envisioned by the original designers. And a technology with a new use has a new life. It's that simple. So that means that as, <clears throat> as many people as that we have, every time you think you are not 
an engineer or a scientist. You're just an everyday person. Because you thought to use it this way, you're actually contributing to the great innovation, which is technology. And actually, Rick, I, I always love the, they, they used to teach us back in engineering school how when they first tried to do the spacewalks, because you'd go out there and they would be this, this sort of chain kind of going around and they'd have him, and Buzz Aldrin came back saying, you're killing me out there because I'm trying to hold on, I'm trying to do something out there. And one engineer went back and was playing with his baby daughter's toy in which you know you could freeze it in various positions. And then they realized, oh my goodness, if we just let go and freeze it in this position, we had something to, to uh, uh, twist off of. So the idea is, how could the idea come from playing with your, your baby daughter's toys? Ideas are everywhere, and they're free. <laughs> they're there if we can see them and connect them together. Um, and when we have new technology, we have life changes. We're closing in on 7 billion people in, on the planet. That's only 50 million we have to go, which is why I'm using 7 billion. So, you know, 50 million people here and there, you know, pretty soon you have a lot of people. And uh, we have 7 billion people on the planet. We have 5 billion cell phones. Okay, raise your hand if you have two cell phones. Raise your hand if you've got a cell phone, at least one cell phone in a draw drawer at home you haven't used. There we go, we go all that. But there's five billion active cell phones on the planet right now. And um, there has been a huge impact from cell phones that went from originally just calling and then texting and now and pictures now. and videoing. Um, in 2009, right here in the San Francisco Bay Area, Oscar Grant was shot and killed in the Fruitvale BART, oh, station. Bart station. Numerous videos were posted to YouTube, viewed, viewed, by, viewed by hundreds of thousands of people. There was no amount of testimony, he said, she said, whatever. They all knew what happened. It was there. It was recorded multiple times. The old regime of who's going to be the trustworthy witness, that's over with. In 2010, this spring, we had the Arab Spring. Revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, civil war in Libya, civil uprisings in Bahrain, Syria, and Yemen major protests in Algeria, Iraq, Jordan, Morocco, and Oman, minor protests in Kuwait, Lebanon, Mauritania, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, and Western Sahara, all fueled by social media, primarily cell phone based because most of those people couldn't possibly afford a laptop or a PC, but they can afford a cell phone. This is our students' world. Let's contrast this to our parents' world, and in some cases here, grandparents' world. Doris Kearns Goodwin, presidential historian and author of such books as No Ordinary Time, tells us about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. If you will recall, it was several years ago when he was, when there was to be a memorial for FDR, and there was a huge uproar about the statue, one statue he was going to be in his wheelchair. The, the American people didn't understand he was paralyzed from the waist down. They didn't know it. In fact, in one State of the Union speech, he would, have, he would come in and have big braces to stand up. And he would be, just as they do now, you see the President come down the aisle in Congress to give a State of the Union, and he's surrounded by Secret Service people and his shaking hands and that kind of thing. That's exactly what he was doing. He had braces on his legs, he was coming down, the aisle, shaking hands, and what happened? FDR took a huge spill, sprawled right down the aisle. They picked him up and they kept going. No one reported it. The entire American media was there. No one reported it. One cell phone in Congress some 80 years ago would have pierced the media filter, would have broken the media complicity. Media complicity is gone. We can, we can complain all we want about. Some people say, are they really the fine. media rules or whatever? Media complicity is over. So, this, so is why, this is why we like to say on Tech Nation, technology is the silent partner of history. It was true in FDR's day, it is true today, and it will be true in the years to come. Technology is chase, changing the face of the earth. It's not just about what good gadget can I do now? It changes all humanity, and the entire planet. Now, interesting, from an educational perspective, is that technology seemed to start in the minds of one or two people. 
Google, we have Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Yahoo, Jerry Yang, David Philo, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, and the list goes on. None of these ideas were revolutionary. Many of these people were thinking, many people rather, were thinking of the same ideas at the same time. But these are the people that happen to bring them to successful commercial fruition. So that's why we know about them. But in every case, it's one, two people saying, hey, and then other people start to jump on board and make it happen. The truth is, I believe, and I think we can demonstrate this, there is a collective technology soup from which ideas flow. In June, Steve Jobs announced iCloud, which among other things, syncs up your data from all your devices through what you got in the cloud. And I actually have two laptops and a Blackberry, and, and it's like, I mean, I thought up this application immediately going, I'm going to be crazy because I got too much stuff here. You have to have it when you've got multiple computing uh, resources. You can be traveling. You can be wherever you are. Now, uh, just after that, a programmer claimed that he had approached Apple earlier with his software and the idea that Apple had stolen it from him. But we all thought this up. This was the natural next implementation of iCloud. And you didn't hear much after that, because actually, even at the time, Apple offered him a job, <laughs> saying, well, why don't you come? You can, this is good. Work with us here. It's like there are most ideas that you find aren't just the singular idea of one person or two that we know about, but in fact, many as they arrive from this collective technical soup. Now, half of these enterprises that I'm talking about were started while they were students where they had the idea while they were students and did it shortly thereafter, which makes the work that we do extremely important. Because we don't know which of our students are going to be wildly innovative. And we want all our students to be innovative at every level. Now I'm going to tell you a story about somebody I don't think you uh, uh, have heard of before. Um, and, but it's not a story I could tell most people. But because you're, you're, you have an appreciation for technology, I think you will. Uh, I'm going to go back to a fellow who was a sophomore at Purdue in about 1969. And it's like, what difference could 1969 make? That was a long time ago. And it's like, just wait. And uh, the, uh, this was a student at the time. They would have big uh, rooms full of teletypes. Remember those? And it was like real, really loud. And then the continuous form paper. And all these students would be in, maybe 50 students would be in a room. And uh, this guy, Howard Cunningham, Howard uh, figured out a way to graduate to grab the central processor on this CDC 6500, for those of you who are into those things. Um, and so, and he, so could he could actually grab it so nobody could run any of their computers, and then he could release it. And he goes, this is really good. And so uh, he'd grab it, and he'd see the, uh, no digital clocks were hanging around the walls at Purdue at that point. He'd see the second hand go around, and he'd see this like, you know, 1115, or he was the second hand going over the 15, rather. And he'd type, he'd, He'd type in like 20, and it'd take a couple of seconds for the entire room to slow down to nothing. It'd be one second, two seconds. Then he'd see it go to 20, and it's like, wow, and it all come to life again. He was like, can you imagine this kid? He's like 19 or 20. I want to remind you that the judgment portion of the male brain doesn't fit, fill in on average until 22. <laughs> okay. For those of you having to work with these fellas. Um, and, uh, uh, and so he was so excited. And so uh, he did it again. <laughs> and this was really exciting. And then it's like he saw the second hand come up. And it was at like 55. And so he goes, OK, 56. And he goes, I'll type in 60, so because they can't have it come down that much. And it goes 58, 59. And then the second hand kept going around. And he's like, what, what? And he realized, oh my god, after 59, it goes to zero. It'll never go to 60. <laughs> So he picks up his listings. He picks up his stuff. Everybody is just sort of like, what the heck's going on? It's not coming back this time. And he comes out of the room. And coming down the ha hallway uh, with the head of the computing center and like four systems programmers, like sort of like a phalanx of, of horses leading a parade at Mardi Gras, you know, <laughs> they were coming at him. And, he, and John Steele, I remember him to this day, goes, you. <laughs> Howard says, <laughs> not me. I can't go my mother goes, you. And he goes, and he goes, you're hired. 
which is how I met Howard. He, I was like, hey, everybody else around here is a graduate student. They stuck me, they didn't have any females, so they stuck me in with the kid who was the undergraduate. And, uh, and also a high school student whose parents were, were uh, professors. It's like, okay, we'll put you three in, in a room by yourselves because we don't know who you are. And uh, uh, I, I, I handed him and he finally told me that. And, he, and I said, well, this is really interesting, really interesting uh, that they would take these kind of people instead of sending them home, they incorporate them, somehow find a way to put them, give them white hats instead of black hats. And Howard, years later, invented something called the wiki, and um, uh, he was really interesting how he did it. He uh, uh, actually went to a small conference at University of Illinois. At this point, he had a master's degree. They were doing technical work, and they wanted papers to come out, collective papers to come out. So he wrote this thing up, and uh, he said, "Everybody, just you know, come in and write your write what you want to create here. And you know, if I might not get everything right, so just write over me." And and oh got really God. angry with him. He goes, he, he's like a nice guy. He doesn't let people get angry with him. He goes, they're really angry. And then he goes, somebody has to be in charge. So last millennium, somebody has to be in charge. Some, Some, somebody. <laughs> somebody has to, you know, correct this. Somebody has to, you know. and, uh, and he says, well, this is obviously, you know, an idea that's not going to go anywhere. And, uh, and he was just thinking so far out of the box. He didn't know there was a box. Uh, he goes, but he thought it'd be useful. You know, so today, of course, we have Wikipedia. We use wikis in our teaching. I use it extensively in my teaching with, with uh, groups that are you know, together. Uh, we use wikis at NPR. For instance, we just went to the, uh, the big international bio conference. I did 52 interviews and science interviews in three and a half days. Couldn't talk. I just like, <laughs> what? More science? And, uh, but I had four producers, and they used a wiki to actually organize all those people, the stories and all of that. Once again, the creator of a technology can never predict how his or her technology will be used. Now, one, one place where education and community colleges and technical colleges, especially those, the community and, and technical colleges, are, are becoming a big place in the technology field is because it is more and more important to have the additive effect. Uh, Rick was saying, you know, how, um, uh, it's like, well, when are we going to retire? It's like, well, not only can't we afford to retire, but biotech is keeping us alive another 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And so that was never, you know, that was never the idea <laughs> to be around that long. Uh, but it's actually happening. And so with the massive changes in technology, how do you take something? I mean, I, what are you going to do with the, I was talking to a guy the other day who was a programmer in Silicon Valley, and he got his bachelor's degree in computer science in 1978. And he goes, I really have to keep this job because nobody believes I know any, I have experience, but I have no way to prove that I know anything new. I have no way to show that I know. And as a matter of fact, I'm not exactly clear what object-oriented programming is, but, <laughs> you know. So the additive effect because I, I always have to, uh, I, I'm, I know this is terrible, but I, all these people saying we're going to do a lot for technology, we're going to do a lot for science. We do K through, it's like, wait a minute, K, we're going we're gonna to go out to kindergartners and first graders to save our butts in 30 years? <laughs> you know, wait a minute. We got a whole lot of people now who are really capable. It's a question of transitioning workforces. We're also talking about adding on to established degrees because as you get older and technology changes or you want to go in another way um, or the landscape changes, um, you don't want to go back and get an entire other degree. Now, I am a professor at USF in the business school um, and we have a managing director of the biotechnology program there. And what we did was we are into educating working adults in addition to traditional students. Just this year, we have more working adults coming back to us for degrees than our traditional student population. We're as shocked as anybody. But this is exactly what people need to do. And uh, so the concentration in biotechnology applies in uh, the MBA. It applies in the Master's in Information Systems. We now have a professional Master's in Biotechnology, half of which are the, the business courses, the other half are the science. Half are science. I mean, it's just it's going extending on and on. But we're seeing it, and the people interested in this are the people who are working here, and not only in this biotech cluster, but in all of Silicon Valley, who may want to transition into biotech, or who actually want to know something. So whenever education 
is new and unprecedented. Whenever there's a new and unprecedented point in education, that's certainly where we see the value of coming in with community colleges and technology, technical colleges. Um, witness the NSF-funded BioLink. It's a question of there are people from all kinds of backgrounds coming in to, uh, to learn what's going on. Now, I want to make a few notes about biotechnology as opposed to simply digital technology or IT or information systems because there is a special challenge with biotech. While personal digital technology has permeated all of our lives and all of our workplaces, few of us operate in the world of life science. Few of us feel comfortable working in the world of life of science. And as we think, well, we'll just kind of put it over here. Let's understand something. The innovation of biotechnology drives one third of the world's economy. It's like, well, that got my attention. You know, how could that be? Pharmaceuticals, healthcare, agriculture, alternative fuels, biodefense. It's at the very nature of identity. The idea, as technology is moving forward here, that you'd have to carry an ID card when it is impossible to not shed your DNA. It's impossible for you to leave this room and not have left your DNA behind. We are our identities. And of course, justice is one example. If you've been following the Amanda Knox appeal in Perugia, Italy, if you weren't asleep for the Casey Anthony trial, it's as much about where DNA is as where DNA isn't and what we need to do there. Clearly, massive expanse. For the first time in human history, we're going from the lab bench to the bedside to the field to kits in Wal Walgreens, which test paternity. Now, I have to say, for the person who's actually watched soap operas over the years, you know, a, I would say that every show for like 30 years of the soap operas was about who is really the father, and did they know that they're the father? And it all boiled down to somebody breaking in and getting a little sheet of paper out, and could that be, and did they know, and this kind of, well, the, all those lines are gone out of, out of soap operas. It's like, we know, we know who everybody is. It's no more, there's no reason not to. Um, um, but given all of that, we now have business carrying things from the lab bench to reality, and that's what our education process is about. And while uh, these businesses are all based in life science, most of the jobs in biotech are familiar. They're in finance, they're on IT, HR, manufacturing, laboratories, laboratory technicians, salespeople, projectors, and the list goes on. They're, the dirty little secret of that is that less than 1% are scientific researchers. To make it happen, we need all the people we already know, we already about. know about. And yet I hear people say to me all the time when I talk to them about, hey, why don't you come in? We'll teach you some of this. You know, and they, we're in the world's largest biotech cluster. There are 1,300 companies here. There are you know, several hundred thousand jobs. And they're like, eh, I, I can't do biotech. It's science. Biotech is something that you can't look up online. And I'm living proof, because I was an engineer. I mean, what did I need life science for? Physics, calculus, that's what we did. It's like life science, what do we need that for? I learned, I learned, believe me. Um, but here's a great example. Um, I was uh, on the board of the Tech Museum of Innovation in San Jose. And you know how it is with boards. You kind of find you know, the people you're friends with. And every time you go in, you start to sit with them. And I sat next to a gal, she was great. She was the president of a company called Affymetrics. And I didn't know anything about Affymetrics. And I kept sitting next to her and we just howled. I went down there once because we had a little subcommittee meeting there and just, oh, it was so good. Finally I said, I gotta figure it out. So I went out online and I'm looking at this thing and I was like, geez, looks like they have like a database. I couldn't figure out what they did, you know. <laughs> and then it was like six months later, I was in Switzerland going through stem cell institutes and laboratories, and there were all these Affymetrix machines. And because of Affymetrix, there was a major contributor how we could first decode the human genome. <laughs> I was like, ooh, this is really important stuff. So, but think about somebody who's been a lifelong salesperson and says, I got all this experience. I see Affymetrix is hiring. What's the first thing you do? You go to the website, you say, what am I selling? I say, oh, I don't know what I'm selling. You know, so I'm not gonna go there. You know, so what we're talking about is major workforce issues and how do we convince our current workforce to come into a biotech area. So it's, it, we have to understand that we need education desperately. 
Can't we sell amazing science? Well, who are the buyers? The people who already like science. So I was speaking, and here's the truth. It's like it doesn't matter. Uh, for jobs, biotech cluster will bring people in. And there's a lot of people in the biotech cluster working in there who don't know. I had a student at one of my classes work just under the CFO of a company not to be named. And he, I made him come back every week and attempt to explain what the company's product was. Really good at finance, no idea what it was. And every week I'd send him out and I'd get people to help him. And by the end of the class, the end of seven weeks, he actually said, hey, you know, I actually know what, I, what this is all about. And you know, nobody else does in my office. You know, uh, Two young men uh, who worked in information systems at Genentech and had for a while, uh, what did they tell me? They looked at each other when I was talking about something in science about a Genentech product. And they say, look, we're just happy if we can pronounce the names. <laughs> so the idea is not just getting people into biotech. It's getting people in biotech to understand what is the business proposition of the company I'm working for. What is the total landscape? If you're working in something, you can be a little cog in a wheel. But if you really want to be effective, if you want to be one of these innovators, if you want to do something like this, you've got to understand the total about what you're talking about. So you might call it um, a fear of science. Uh, some have called it science anxiety. And there's been some work over the years on science anxiety. But it has that research has one very fatal flaw. It treats science as a single black box. Now, why is that a problem? Well, let's talk sports. You say, you love football? You're going to love the Tour de France. <laughs> you love golf? Let's go bowling. It's like we know, about, we know about sports. Sports is very multifaceted. Some people say it's got to have a ball in it. I'm not even interested. There's all kinds of sports for all kinds of people. Well, science is as large and diverse a place as sports and even more so. And it's complex. To presume that a mathematician would get excited about molecular biology, an astrophysicist about anatomy and, and physiology, it, it won't happen. Biotech needs people who can muster some affinity for biology. Not, oh, I want to be a biologist or a geneticist or anything, but can muster some affinity. So once we are able to break down, de-black box science, we can then, not just in biotechnology, but in all the kinds of workforce skills we need, say, could you, I mean, I say, I can tell you somebody, I'm looking and saying, you'll never be, you'll never be a mechanical, and you have to be a mechanical engineer because you've got to hold it in your hand, but double E's, electrical engineers, they don't have to see it because all those little electrons are flowing around. <laughs> but, oh yeah, mechanical engineering. It's like we are many different people, and th those skills have to get broken out. If we're going to get better at teaching them, we're going to get better at attracting the right people into them, because every, every subject is not for everybody. And our challenge is to get students, in this particular case, to say they can, convince them they can get into biotech, they can understand enough science, and I call it minimalist science. The least you need to know the, the, to get the point. Why? Hey, who doesn't have DNA? So that's where we need to go there. So my, of my many overall calls to action, of which I have many, I'm also told by my, my production staff that I have many hidden agendas, some hidden from me. <laughs> I have a lot of calls to action here. Um, I simply want to note three. So in summary, in your work with students, be appreciative of the explosion of technology which is going on and will continue to go on. It's not just teaching this subject, but preparing, preparing them for that change and that explosion. We need to de-black box science into the components that students can ident self-identify with. We need to recognize that each of your students could be a remarkable innovator, whether they can build or just figure out how to use a technology in a new way. How do we help the Howards? How do we help the Howard in all of us? And how do we recognize and encourage the unsung heroes and heroines who make the darn thing work in the first place, who try to help you when your technology doesn't work, who think up a way to make something run 10% faster, who look at the error list on a device and try to fix it and not ignore it, who during a technical meeting asks the quiet question, Will this hurt anyone? Do we have an ethical responsibility here? These are the people who do the real work of technology. 
that we teach every day. At the end of the day, it's our commitment to these students, removing roadblocks, overcoming unwarranted resistance, expanding their vision, convincing them of their own possibilities, repeating again and again and again, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. Thank you very much. Now we can.